welcome to Academy of Tone 198 with a very strange song from the 80s or 90s. Um, yeah, this has something to do with my weekend. Um, <clears throat> this um, episode is called Why Less Can Be More. And um, <clears throat> what I was using was just a Stratocaster, my Stratocaster, my 61. Um, that I kind of traded in for three Stratocasters, um, those good old Japan vintage Squire Stratocasters. Um, I had to sell all of the three of them to have the budget to buy this one. And it was not a bad decision. Um, and that's something I want to talk in this episode after a few stories about the weekend. Um, and it's, it's about what we can gain if we reduce. That's kind of schizophrenic, but um, it goes back to my vacation um, when I discovered that I had lots of fun with this strat that I took um, on with me on the vacation. And I discovered things that happened with myself while playing or having fun with the guitar, not having any other toys. I didn't have an amp, I didn't have pedals, I had nothing. I just had a guitar with me. And this was kind of a, a little experience for me that um, made me think a little deeper. And um, I think I learned something uh, from that and we can all learn from that thing. There's nothing wrong about having more guitars, but there's also something about reducing playing your main guitar and getting more out of that guitar. But okay, that's something I will dive into and I will explain why I could get such thick tones from the Strat. And um, I have actually had that philosophy um, my whole entire life to go on stage just with one guitar um, for many reasons just to have less on stage to travel with less to carry less to have less guitars to take uh, uh, and get them in tune and to change strings and you know less can be more but before we dive into this topic which I find quite interesting um, Let's talk about a weekend. First, I had um, two little gigs um, of Sean, who was here last week, the episode Blues Rock. Um, and I played two concerts for his CD release party uh, in the Ruhrgebiet, for those who have attended and for those who don't know. Um, the Ruhrgebiet is one of those areas in Germany where we have the most people um, living. I think it's 13 million in this area. And um, yeah, we had two nice gigs on Friday and Saturday. And um, it was a premiere for me with the Amp X and the Wah. Watch this little clip. First time the Wah Wah in action on stage.
So this was Friday and Saturday. And after the gig on Saturday, I was driving back home to Saarbrücken, oh, three and a half hours drive, uh, you know, night, had a few hours of rest. And then I had, um, yeah, a very nice uh, thing here in Saarbrücken um, about Frank Farian. Okay, who the fuck is Frank Farian? Frank Farian is maybe one of the most successful producers in pop history. Um, he is the guy behind Bonnie M, Milli Vanilli, No Mercy, uh, oh man, yeah, he produced Meat Love. Um, <clears throat> and he um, had a few, he had several studios. Um, one studio was here in close to um, where I live and I actually worked there and I met his manager a couple of times there, Hans-Jörg Meyer, and um, then he had a, a studio in Frankfurt, in Rosbach, because this was closer to Frankfurt International Airport, so it was easier for him to work there. And I also worked there. Um, and then he finally moved to Miami and he had a studio over there, uh, working there. Um, and he was working with another producer, Ferdl, Ferdinand Förster, who actually produced <laughs> or tried to produce my German singing band Dreist. Um, we never got the deal. But um, yeah, anyway, there's a lot of connections um, going on. And I was invited for the Sunday morning talk um, since there's the Milli Vanilli uh, movie showing in the cinemas. And um, yeah, uh, Frank Farian passed away just recently on the 26th of January uh, in Miami after having uh, at the age of 82 and he was working a lot. For me, well, I, I, I was invited for, you know, being the guy that worked in the pop business too. And uh, I didn't know him that well, but I met him like once or twice briefly, uh, but never really worked with him. But I know many stories and I had uh, the occasion to, um, to, to meet the guys who have worked with him a lot. Hans-Jörg Meyer, who was kind of his um, right hand for, for decades. Um, that's the guy, um, the second on the left. Um, and then there's another guy um, um, who, um, who was actually playing in, in his band, um, Herbert Linnebacher, um, who's the guy next to me. Uh, and he, so what, 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 what was happening? We were kind of reflecting on the life of such a icon, uh, not a, not a musician in the way that he is like a killer, whatever, uh, instrumentalist, no, but a producer. <laughs> and the funny thing is, um, I, I knew a few stories, but I heard even more stories that kind of made me think uh, about what I am doing. And it's like one story was kind of um, great and iconic and it could have been me as well. Um, it was the story that uh, Mr. Farian was mixing one of the Bonnie M songs and sending the, the master, well, a previous master tape, a listening tape to the record company. And since he was such a perfectionist, <laughs> Hans Jörg, um, his kind of manager, went to town and saw the record. And then he saw, you know, th this new Bonnie M record already in the stores. And then he, he thought, wow, what's, what's going on? Why is the record out? Uh, th they have been really fast. Um, and then he bought the record <laughs> and he called Frank Farian and told him, I just bought the new Bonnie M record. And Frank Farian goes, 
fuck, these guys are crazy. This is not the release version. I'm still mixing on it. I'm not happy with it. I'm not releasing this album. And they had to trash 80,000 vinyl albums of Bonnie M. I mean, you know, it's like wasting a million because the producer Frank was not happy with the mix. Maybe the rest of the world didn't care, but if it wasn't right, it was not ready to release. And that was a, a thought that I, I can de definitely understand because, you know, products like MPX, there are a lot of decisions um, that have to be taken. And, you know, if you want to have a hit, you have to do a lot of things right. And uh, it's a string of decisions. And maybe one decision is not so important, but you have to have hundreds of little decisions that all sum up. And if everything is right, and if you are lucky, then you get a hit. And Mr. Farian was kind of not bad because he sold 150, 150 million albums only with Bonnie M. And he, he probably sold just as many with Mini Vanilli and, uh, <laughs> and No Mercy and, uh, you know, all these other projects that he produced. And I also learned that he was a guy that took a lot of risks. He went all in with everything. If he was convinced of something, he always went all in and was risking his money, his own money. And um, yeah, and the people that worked with him, <laughs> they sometimes suffered from this decision from this kind of a perfectionist. Anyway, it was, it was uh, great. And uh, that's why I chose that song, which is a bit bizarre. Um, I actually wanted to play something else, uh, Toto, but all this stuff was copyright protected. We tried it in uh, copyright strike. It's not possible. I, I wanted to, um, to, <laughs> to play uh, Girl Goodbye or Hold the Line or anything. It's not possible, unfortunately. I mean, the <laughs> because what I wanted to do is to, sh to demonstrate that I can be a Les Paul player, even with a Stratocaster. A good enough Les Paul sound can be created with a Strat with a few toys. And this brings me to the topic of today's episode. Um, one guitar and focus on one guitar for a while. What do we get from doing that? And, you know, being a perfectionist on the one hand on, and, and being somebody that um, had one good guitar in his collection and a few other guitars that I actually don't, didn't care that much. Uh, um, reflecting about that, I, in a retrospective, I know that by limiting myself to just that one strat and doing everything with that, I became, let's say, a better Strat player than a Les Paul player. Um, and in the end, probably that was giving me and winning the Strat King title. Here, this, uh, yeah, I have the, there is some reward for it here. <laughs> do, 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 do. Fender Strat King award uh, like this anyway so um you know why why did fender give me this um award um well probably because somehow they they liked what i did on the stratocaster it was all about stratocasters and why did they like it because i probably put all my focus all my energy to the Strat and not to the Les Paul and not to the Super Strat and not to the Les Paul Junior and the Telecaster over here. Um, so, 
and here's a few examples that's a that's my strat into the amp one clean tone you know the standard This is how a strat should sound like. Okay, it's there. Okay, and when I was playing with tic-tac-toe, I had, you know, big stages and I had to sound like the guitar on the record. But the guitar on the record was not a strat. That was a Gibson 335, just like my uh, red one. Let me show you that guitar. Whoops. Uh, stay. Okay. Great guitar, great sound. But it's a 335. Okay. Now I try to get that tone on stage with my strat. And this is like. It's not that sound. But I made miss myself a pedal. to bypass. Pedal on. Not too far from that 335. Okay. And why did I do that? Um, because I didn't want to bring my 335 on stage for a very simple reason. If you plug in um, a cable into this guitar, the cable, if you do show, you can... I was afraid to, 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 to kill that guitar, that's one for one reason. The next reason is uh, I don't have a whammy bar, I have to change guitars uh, and all that stuff. And then um, I have to adjust the... Uh, the volume level for that other guitar, then, uh, you know, all that stuff kind of um, is bringing some stress, you know, just having an extra guitar for me was stress. So I tried to avoid to bring that other guitar and I knew this is a great guitar that I would like to play most of the show. And so this was my choice for my main guitar. And I, I'm, I think every guy of yours has his favorite guitar in the collection. We all might have 10 guitars, but if you're honest, there's one that stands out. That is the guitar that you use maybe 80%. Um, and then there's the guitar that you might use. Oh, wait a minute, I get rid of my phone. Um, only a few times. There's nothing wrong about that, but that's not the guitar that talks so much with you. And for me, by reducing the amount of guitars that I would use, I also reduced the amount of trouble <laughs> because less is more. And of course, I had to find solution several solutions for a few well uh, challenges that I had uh, to deliver whatever was needed. Um, sometimes it's totally okay to sound different but sometimes if that guitar line is doing a certain job um, it's it doesn't work if you are not in that kind of zone. But I 
always knew, even back in the days, that my strat can be tweaked with different settings on the amp, with different channels or with a pedal um, to such an extent that it would work fine. Nobody would really complain or notice and I would be happy. Um, of course, there are limits. I would say I can do, I can replace that 335 and a Les Paul um, okay-ish with my Strat, um, but I could not use that Strat as a metal guitar. Well, I was never a metal guitar player anyhow, but there is, of course, there is a limit. There is something that that you can't get out of something that is, you know, done. But I find it quite astonishing um, how much I could achieve with, with just one guitar and a few pedals, very, very few. And what I realized by just having that one guitar and having the challenge to sound like somebody that plays a 335 or somebody that plays some humbucker style riffs or notes. Um, you know, I had, to, I had to make that guitar sound like it. And the pedal or the amp setting um, is only one part. But the playing is the other part. And this is the reward that you can take away from this challenge. You are challenged in a way and by reducing, which means I personally played that Les Paul style things on the Strat. I learned how to make that Strat sound not typical Strat. I learned to make that Strat sing. And that was part, became part of my style. Okay, let me show you. For instance, we, we just heard the Strat high end. I would call this the humbucker simulator. And then I check. A, 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 let's let's take a the modern channel, for instance. Okay, and have it on bypass. One already does half of it, but you know that kind of sweet um, humbucker style um, tone is my little boost uh, or frequency shift pedal. Um, okay, and once you have that tone, I, you start to play differently uh, in a way because. You have a different tone and the tone interacts with what you're doing. I mean, you, you get even the, the, the yeah, feedback.
Okay. Hmm. Switch off the pedal. Take a typical strat sound. Totally back in Stratland, and it's it's okay, but it's more percussive. It has a lot more aggression. It has more bite. It has all the good qualities of a Stratocaster. Okay, um, that's one lesson. So the tone inspires you, and I learned to get more out of a Strat than the ordinary guys would do because they wouldn't go that strange extra mile in you know trying to get different tones from that one strat unless you had like so, some modeler and and you just have one guitar so if you think back at your early days where you had not so much gear maybe you learned things that you don't learn later, that you didn't learn later. Um, anyway, so um, in that kind of reduction, I see a quality and I can take this further. I can try, um, I remember that I had my Telecaster being in the studio and uh, the Telecaster sounded pretty good and um, everybody thought, yeah, that's um, th that's something for a telly. And then I took my Strat and I took whatever my bridge pickup. Of course, I would choose another M sound for like uh, something like this, maybe. And use this kind of... And if the guitar is great, you can actually get there. Um, let me find a setting for that here. get a picture so um, and just by having this sound in my head I play different start uh, things on my strat 
because it's an inspiration to think of that guitar and play this guitar. Okay? Um, and on the other hand, it's like if you only play one guitar, maybe just for a certain period of time, you come closer to the instrument. You discover things that you would not usually see in that instrument. And um, I think that's um, something like a, a whatever, fa fasting, you know, like not eating too much uh, or what the other guys call Ramadan. <laughs> you make the Ramadan guitar, you take your favorite guitar and just play that for a while and don't touch the other ones. And you will see you get something out of that because you discover things that you usually don't see in that guitar because you have too many choices. And on the other hand, having too many choices also is destruction. If you spend your whole entire life thinking about shall I play this Telecaster or my other Telecaster which is upstairs or shall I play this Strat or that Strat or that Strat or this Les Paul in the corner or that Les Paul or the Maple Strat or whatever, you, don't, you are not productive, you're not doing anything, you're just uh, busy thinking and not playing. And I'm not saying it's you should sell all your guitars and uh, but I'm sure you have too much stuff <laughs> just like myself. The good thing in my environment here is I can leave the gear somewhere where I don't see it all day and um, that helps because my mind is clean. It's it's if I need something, I can get it, um, but I actually have the feeling that I don't even have to own it if I had access to it. So over the last years, I kind of came very relaxed when it comes to boutique, whatever, pedals and amps and expensive guitars. And I, I'm not like longing for, I need that and I... I, I have another thing on my wish list. I'm, I feel quite satisfied with what I've got, which is too much. I'm, I'm rather on the way of getting that stuff that I like into my Amp X and then probably sell it, do a video and you guys can have it uh, because I don't need that anymore after that. Uh, that's the kind of collection in case I need it. Um, feeling, but honestly, when I when I think of, of what I'm doing these days, I'm not even needing most of that stuff because I'm not a session player anymore. I do my thing. I have only to be myself and nobody expects me to be a metal guy that has a whatever, EMG guitar. That's why I don't have one. <laughs> um, and yeah, so I can focus on the things that actually bring joy and I'm not getting distracted from having fun and having enjoying what I've got because I'm, I can be happy with a lot less than I thought. And um, that brings me to the point like, you know, look at my t-shirt. It's a one. <laughs> it's only one. And if you look what is in my t-shirt collection or the clothes choices that I have, well, there's a one, there's an X, there's Academy of Tone. And for the summer, there are the M1 shirts. And Underneath those, you find my regular t-shirts, which I actually don't have to wear anymore <laughs> because I like my own t-shirts so much that I'm totally fine. And I have no, I have no stress to decide which t-shirt I wear because I, I have rather a one or an X 
depending on what amp I play. And and if if I don't play, they are fine too. And I don't need other things. My life became quite quite easy with my shirt collection. <laughs> and the good thing is I don't have to pay for them anyhow. <laughs> And, you know, I don't have even to go shopping. And, you know, that, that the time that you spend going to a boutique and, and looking for a beautiful t-shirt, you know, for me, it's, it's history. I've done that, which, which was fun, but it, 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 that simplified my life. Um, and that's a cool thing. Um, and that's the same thing with many th things, I, I have only one car. Uh, it's the same philosophy, you know. It's a convertible car, but it has a, a like a a real top. It's a, it's a BMW 3 Series, 12 years old, but the top is a solid. So when I close the car, it's just like a standard limousine. It, but if I want, oops, if I want to have a convertible, I push the button and I have a convertible. I have one car. And uh, on that one car, I have my extension for my bike. That's all I need. Um, I don't, you know, other people, they have a, a convertible car for the summertime. Then they have a transportation car for when they go on the road. And then they have a fast car for fun driving. And they have three cars. I was never like that. Because then you have to maintain three cars. You have to buy tires for three cars. You have to get uh everything uh and it's it's just too much time and then in the end you know i have one car i have to find only one car keys that's sometimes <laughs> already a lot but you know one key that's all i need and i'm good to go ah yeah um we need blue guitar shoes boutique to go that's that's a good one yeah uh boutique to go let's think about that yeah um um, anyway, what's going on in the chat here? Um, yeah, consumption kills creativity. That's something about that, yeah? Um, um, but that is probably also desired by capitalism. Um, yeah, whatever. That, 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 that goes very far. I, but I, I just want to inspire you guys um, to focus for a while. And then you by reducing you get a reward. That's my point. And um, it's, it's a mental thing um, that results in bringing you some good things. Ah, I see here <laughs> the comments of my Is it still the old Audi A4 convertible? No, um, the, the, the old Audi had to retire after half a million kilometers on it. Um, so the, it was a great car. Um, Audi A4 convertible, but this had a, um, uh, a cloth kind of top. Now with the BMW, I have only four cylinders. The Audi had six cylinders. So the new car is about the same age. I bought it used, you know, because I give a fuck. Uh, and it was a great car, or it's still a great car. It is as fast as the Audi. Audi. It takes less... Um, fuel um, and you know somebody bought that car and didn't use it because uh, it was the the car the, the, I think the, sa the same here's the story it was maybe the third car in the family and for, for the wife and the wife uh, preferred to drive um, the Mini Cooper you know and so that BMW was just sitting there having no mileage on it. So when I bought it, it was 10 years old, but it had only like 70,000 on it. And since it wasn't used, they had to have a new compressor for it. So I bought it like mint condition, woman clean, you know, like really, sp I messed it up, of course. Uh, but, and then, you know, all the, the critical component was uh, brand new, so I can, you know, I can ride that car now and I, I get the miles out of that one. And um, yeah, it, it's a good deal and I have no bad conscience about it because it's old or old enough and it's fun. 
it's actually big fun. So I'm very happy with what I've got. Um, we all need AMP1 and AMPX as beach balls. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good idea. Yeah, I mean, imagine just like a, what is it? a Luftmatratze, air mattress, air mat or whatever that is. AMPX has the, the right kind of things and we could even have a flap so you can... <laughs> Oh, this, yeah, we are getting creative here. This is good. Um, uh, blue guitar shirts are uh, classic. Going, uh, don't go out of style. Yes, that's actually something um, I pay a lot of attention to, to do things that are not too super trendy. Because once you get older, you look back at some old pictures and you think, man, this was totally goofy. <laughs> When I had that kind of hair, you know, the, uh, haircut and um, this kind of weird hip trousers from the 80s, baggy trousers and uh, pink sunglasses, that's, there are pictures of that. Okay, one day I show you the forbidden. <laughs> um, Ah, somebody has a, a, a BMW X1. Well, X. There's something about BMW because they also many manufacture the 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 the, the, the Mini Cooper, um, which is one, and of course written O N E. But uh, that was again an inspiration for M1. I'm I'm, I'm honest because um, that I think the Mini Cooper. Uh, has a logo and I don't know what it was but I, I remember the logo uh, was fascinating yeah um, yeah it has only three cylinders um, yeah some cars have less fewer cylinders and they, they always uh, they're still fine and they have less consumption which is cool okay uh, le uh, let me check a few more comments before i move on i remember that most of the fun with my angle straight 501 combo and the 1990 us strut ultra only the cable between and nothing else yeah um i would say whatever it is that's a personal thing that you like the most if you pick that one guitar and one amp whatever it is i don't care it can be an angle it can be whatever a marshall it can be whatever you like best and if you live with just that combination reduced for a while you will discover things that you usually would not find and that will bring you to another level um, at least for a while and then you can open up and you go, go back for the thing um, <laughs> the blue jeans <laughs> well with my name you can do a lot of bullshit um, honestly uh, I had big trouble when I started to, to, to travel internationally with blue because they go black or blurk or and it sounds really shitty in some italian for in, for instance it's 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 probably not a nice thing <laughs> but um at least i'm not richie kotzen for the germans they know exactly what that means i mean hello mr kotzen which for the americans you have to understand what that means it means hello mr vomit you know on guitar richie kotzen oh <clears throat> He knows that. I talked with him. He knows that. <laughs> I think he has been told before. But uh, Blug is as bad, in a way, in some countries. And therefore, I came up with the idea to call it Blue Guitar and make the whole thing blue. I like blue anyhow. Blue jeans, so we make blue jeans. And then we make uh, Blug. Um, and, and in German, you can do a lot of bullshit with that. You can be the Blug Begleiter which is uh, coming from fluke fluke which means flying and it sounds like a 
you know, like um, stewardess uh, or the guy that is on the airplane. <clears throat> okay, anyway, um, what's going on here in the chat? Um, I feel like programmable analog SOC have gotten enough input to bandwidth to finally be in the... I don't get it. It's something about effects, pedals and headroom. Um, what my only brand new guitars are a Squire and an Aria Pro. This is all old, old stuff, I guess. All other guitars are used ones. Okay, I like to give some. I like to give second hand stuff a second chance. Ah, okay, yeah. So it's second hand uh, guitars. Um, yeah, that's, uh, we all have our philosophies, you know, some people, whatever your philosophy is and whatever speaks to you, just grab that and make something out of that. Hold on to one thing that means more than the rest. And that's, that's the thing about focusing and you will find you learn something by, by by having a, a different mindset, by having the mindset, oh, I don't need that other, whatever, guitar or car. It's, it's, it's the mindset, how can I get that tone from that guitar? And that's a challenge. And with that challenge, you got get to the next level. You know, and that's a philosophy kind of thing. And without thinking about it, it happened on my vacation with that, uh, you know, Tokai Strat because every day I played it, I thought, wow, it talks more to, my, to me. And before that, it was just my shittiest, well, Strat, that's why I took it with me. I, th I thought if, if I lose that one, it's not a big loss, you know. I even took the, the, even my whatever vintage which is probably cheaper than this one, is more important to me than <laughs> this one. But it became important to me because I did care. And I, I paid attention to this, um, yeah, I, I paid attention to that guitar. I, and that did something with me. And that brings me back to the philosophy of uh, Mr. Frank Farian, the producer, because if, you know, if you look back at his history, he used to be a, a okay but not too good singer himself and he wanted to achieve the next level and he found out that he needed probably better looking people and uh, this is what he took. Um, his imagination was guiding him somewhere. It, 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 nobody told him this was kind of he knew when I take this and I do that and I go all the way, I will get to the next level. And for me, discovering the next level in general is so rewarding. It's like, why do, why do you get up and play the guitar? Well, you get something from it, but the most rewarding part is when you discover something new. It's like, oh, what did I just play? And it's you. You know, everybody plays the same notes because there are on only 12 on the instruments. Well, if you have some Indian scales, you, you, you have some <laughs> flat notes and sharp notes and whatnot. I don't hear that, I can't play that, but um, Jeff Beck could. Um, maybe. But the point is, if you have less, your imagination has to fill the gap. If, if it's materialized, it's already there because boop, you take that guitar and there, there it is. And this makes you lazy. And this kills the skill of being creative in a way. You know, the moment 
where you don't have the solution at hand, you have to come up with your own solution. And by creating your own solution, you gain experience creating a result, fulfilling a dream, because it's not there. And this is why people that have everything are not happy. When you can buy anything that money can buy and you're not still not happy because there is no reward for you. It's either the hunt, you know, like hunting for old guitars, which is totally understandable. I do know there are people that collect things, but you should ask yourself, do you want to be a collector or do you want to be a player or how many present to actually want to be, to be happy. And the more honest you are to yourself, the better the chances are that you're going to be happy. Because once you know that you want to be a collector, you can give a fuck about Ingwie Malmsteen more is more. You play fewer notes because you know I'm all about having that kind of great guitar in my collection and I play one note and I'm happy. But if you always have that bad conscience of I need to be Ingvi more is more and then I have to be Jeff Beck less is more and then there is whatever uh, George Benson jazz is cool and, and then we have uh, John Pritucci um, <laughs> progressive is cool and then BB King vibrato is also cool and then you end up in who are, who am I? So in the moment you reduce and say, I'm not going to be Ingvi and I can skip Petrucci, you can focus on being your own version of BB King. And since you are never going to be BB King, the only chance you can be is yourself. So make your own decision and take a guitar that you like and maybe you know, you play a Stratocaster tr and pr try to be BB King and you come up with something unique and that is creating in the end your own style. And that's the thing that all my heroes had because I think back in the days in the 60s and 70s the choices were limited and the creativity of these guys was giving them their style. I mean they had only a Vox AC30 in in the 60s in the UK and Brian May played that thing and thought doesn't talk to me. What the fuck? And then he discovered a range master pedal and then you know you plug in a range master <coughs> sorry <laughs> um, and then it turns your I play the clean channel, so... turns my M1 into almost a uh, Brian May thing. I can I can play a, a different guitar. I can play now my my Les Paul, and I will still be in in Queen territory. Maybe even more. just one pedal. How many channels is Brian May using? One. How many guitars is he playing? One. 
How many sounds does he get from his setup? A clean sound, a lead sound, and then what are his effects? Maybe the echo. Huh? And he has built a whole career on these few ingredients. Less is more. More money. Less guitars, less amps, more money. Okay? Same thing for a lot of a lot of player, Hank Marvin. No? How many guitars did he play? I mean he did you see him with Les Paul? Probably not. He played Stratocaster and Burns. And that was his no? and if you think about Gary Moore, yes, he played Travels and he played that, but in the end, you know him as the blues guy with, with a Les Paul, sometimes a 335, but only a few guitars. And that's the thing. And no, Brian May plays two guitars, I read in the chat. Yeah, the other one is an acoustic guitar. <laughs> Um, yeah, but probably you, you know what I mean, no? Uh, ah, the, the, the crazy uh, little thing called Love Telecaster. Well, this was an accident. I think this comes from um, uh, Freddie Mercury because uh, Freddie, you know, being gay and, and all that stuff was challenging the band a lot, which was great. You know, I want to break free. I want to break free. You know, it's like, it's so odd that that is, is cool. I mean, this is this is why I love Freddie Mercury and Queen. Um, yeah. But hey, guys, the message is: think about yeah. There's some harmonizers, but he even did the harmonies uh, when there was no harmonizer because he played the stuff in the studio and did the orchestration. And by the way, that's probably also a Freddie, Freddie Mercury thing because Freddie was the guy that came up with this, wow, we have to be different. Uh, we have to be orchestral. We are a different band, no? Uh, because I'm different and, and that's clever. And that's, that's part of the character of Freddie Mercury and became part of the band Queen. Me personally, I don't know Brian May, but I could imagine that he was just a great rock guitar player with a very great ten, uh, sense of taste and a good sense of melodies because any Queen thing you can sing um, and he is not the scale shredder kind of guy and you know and then comes a guy like Mercury that, that has this vision of orchestral rock band playing a little bit of piano or no so that that's just an example um what's going on in the chat here um one paul reads miss american custom with two ember paf pickups hamburger cold splits i would do the job for me playing a cover band from rock yeah i mean see Ma Ma martin s uh, in his comp he has one guitar that would do all this stuff for me personally, I see exactly the point that you have. It's like the Paul Reed Smith guitars, they are so flexible in a way because they are humbucker guitars. They have the blitz, split coil function and they even blend in the other coil a bit um, to balance it out. So it's like next level. And here comes my point. That guitar is super, it's so flexible that I, I personally don't even want it. <laughs> I'd rather have a straight Les Paul or a straight Stratocaster with like my little dummy coil modification so the hum is not an issue. Um, that gives me personally a tonal foundation that is so huge that I can do everything by playing differently. Let me show you why, what I mean. Um, so, clean tone on a strat. It's 
So, nothing special. Okay, I can make it even cleaner. So, all the pedals are off, just the amp one, nothing. So, I just go for the neck. I put the tone halfway down. By the way, this is kind of my similar to my humbucker simulation pedal. Let me demonstrate. Get rid of the Brian May Range Master. Um, so. My pedal. That's the strut as it is. Just by playing without changing that. I didn't touch the tone knob, I didn't touch the pedal. I just used my thumb. I get that tone. Nothing has changed. No electronics, no amp, no pedal, no guitar. Everything is full, on full. Of course, when I use the pick now, it starts to get harder. But with that tone in mind, I play softer with a pick. I'm not playing. I play. Okay, to make it easier for myself, I just reduced the, 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 the tone on that pickup a touch. Now I can even dig in. Yeah. Okay, that's the message here. The Im imagination will guide you what to do and you will find a new... S yeah, and once you understand this new playing technique, you can use it. That's becoming part of your vocabulary and that's cool. That all works. And it, just a different mindset, different pickup, and I get a full opposite sound, full twang. Ah, let me go back to my stack 1970s where I feel home.
helps me even with the jazz playing in a way because that's my home and by the way that's the next thing when you go and have a live concert and you have for example a modeler or you have an amp x and you have all the options you have tons of cabinets to choose from blah, 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 and you think oh i'm using this cabinet for that sound and this cabinet for the next sound and do the switching you know what happens it's like chasing moving targets for the sound guy and probably for you as well so what i learned is having one cabinet one sound this is what brian may and stevie really want they have one sound the whole night um, and they use that makes it easier for the sound guy to place the guitar in the mix because it's not changing it's not move it's not a moving target less is more and then the whole band will sound cooler of course if you are the super pro and have the experience how to get another cabinet in your life setting or set up in a way that it's not a problem for the song it's okay but the mistake or the, the the thing that i can see a lot is that people use things not knowing what the result is for others for the sound guy for instance they just think i heard that i need to have a fender cabinet for a clean tone my whole entire life i was on stage without a fender cabinet I use the Fender cabinets always in the studio to get the best clean tone. But on stage I use 12 inch Celestian speakers, which are definitely not the most famous for having sparkly Fender clean tones. But it always worked. Nobody complained. Everybody happy. Um, and even when I played the funk style guitar in tic-tac-toe, which was part of the band sound. It was not about Marshall Plexis or anything. It was about Fender style 335 clean with the Fender amp is the rhythm guitar for the groovy funk music. And uh, I did it my way and it worked. <laughs> so what's going in country jazz <laughs> yeah country jazz um that reminds me of um, greg koch uh, that's uh he's a tail guy and he has some of the jazz chords i just caught that brings me back to frank farian and that bad joke about Stevie Wonder. If you don't know that joke, here, here it comes. Stevie Wonder. I mean, I wish superstitious, uh, you know, Stevie Wonder has the coolest songs ever. You know, Keys in the, uh, Songs in the Key of Life was one of his greatest albums. And so Stevie Wonder plays a concert <laughs> and there comes, you know, fantastic stuff you know he plays all that his hits and everything is super cool and complicated <laughs> um, everything cool there comes this Japanese guy and the Japanese guy says yeah Stevie that's all great let's just go but please Stevie play a jazz chord Stevie goes back on stage he plays giant steps, he plays all the jazz tunes he ever knew. And, you know, standing ovation, Stevie, 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 you're the greatest. <laughs> and then the Japanese guys come back and says, yeah, Stevie, you are so great, but please, play a jazz chord. Oh, fuck. Stevie goes back on stage and he's even better. He plays all Miles Davis and Wayne Shorter runs licks on the piano and sings in unison it, 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 jazz like crazy best ever. <laughs> then he comes back off stage, sees that Japanese guys again and the Japanese guy says, please Stevie sing, 
I just called to say I love you. Okay, and that's by the way that only song that Frank Farian produced by Stevie Wonder. It's a Schlager, it's a German Schlager. I just called <laughs> to say I love you. Okay, this is going back to Frank Farian. Um, Yeah, that's a good uh, question here. Uh, a good point in the in the chat. AC slash DC. <laughs> a unique sound could make a band popular. Yes, because that's not a moving target. That is a trademark, and that's something that people will memorize. They will recognize the sound of the band and sound. Ah, this sounds like the Dire Straits. You know, when you think about the Dire Straits, the first five, five, six albums, they were the strats on the position here. And whatever Mark Knopfler was playing with his tone, everybody knew it's the Dire Straits. That changed in the later period when when uh, Brothers in Arms came out and he was playing the Les Paul and had overdrive sounds, which is okay in a career to, to have a phase two, but at least the first albums were all the same sound and that helped a lot. Um, Danny Getten, Danny Getten, for those who don't know Danny, Danny Getten, he is killer, killer, killer tele guy. So, yeah. He was uh, a guitar hero for Jeff Beck, okay? And I don't think there were too many guitar heroes for him. Well, besides his early influences, but Danny Getten, deep shit. Um, And again, this is finger, uh, using fingers for the tone. That is even less, get rid of the pick and... That's another example of uh, how you turn smoke under water into money for nothing, which was a copy of Blackmore said Beethoven fifth backwards, but that's that was just a bullshit because he stole it from a Bossa Nova song, which was like very close to the original. Anyway. Um, Somebody writes, um, Clapton's sound was better with the Gibson guitars in his early years with Cream. 
Yeah, again, um, I think Clapton had two faces. Uh, the cream face, which was definitely a, a different Clapton. Uh, and maybe I agree, for me, he was um, the Clapton that gave rock, blues rock, a voice. I mean, the Bino album and the cream sounds were all based on Gibson guitars and uh, Marshall amps and that that was a huge step forward from the traditional blues sound um, with less gain and he created that guitar hero kind of thing and this was the sound that shocked Blackmore and others and tried you know, they're all inspired. I mean, if you listen to Lazy by Deep Purple, it's inspired by Clapton. Um, and that kind of quality Clapton had in his early years. I'm not saying Clapton lost it, but uh, that first phase impressed me a lot. There's also a beauty in his second phase when he did, uh, what was it, 461 Ocean Street. Um, I shot the sheriff and the strats with his music man, uh, kind of understatement guitar, you know, for where he was coming from, from being the god of improvisation and, you know, big sounds and loud. Uh, he was kind of playing a combo amp and having a uh, subtle, delicate and um, fine, very um, not so aggressive and huge and, and fat sound uh, doing more subtle things on the guitar which work was great a different style smoke for nothing and water for free I love that yes I, I could spend I could spend my whole entire life of making bullshit out of stuff that exists um, it, it it's a natural thing with me that's that's why i created my band rock anarchy and we play anything that comes to mind out of you know i mean just having fun i show you something here Thank you. 
on. I could go on for five hours playing Smoke on Bozart. <laughs> it's a Mach piece. If you ever watched uh, Spinal Tap, I'm inspired by Mozart and Bach. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I share the uh, uh, opinion on Clapton Gibson sound. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh that preempt sounds of his strat. Okay, John Mayer was an unexpected return of the individual stratone. Yeah, individual stratone is maybe a good word for that. Um, I never liked that Rolling Stones disco song, but Thomas always makes it sound cool. I always liked that thing. For me, I mean, that's my kind of. I love the Rolling Stones, I love the Beatles, I like the Purple and everything. And they all have their comfort zone, you know. It's, it's like they come and have their roots and this is where their home is. And then like in the 70s, uh, you know, all those rock guys, they were so challenged by the disco. Like the Bee Gees, you know, when they, when they came with the Staying Alive, you know. Uh, Uh. <laughs> Staying alive, and then all the old rockers were not hip anymore, and some of them, Mick Jagger, for instance. And um, uh, Rod Stewart, they came and thought, man, we need to go and be up to date. We have to make some disco rock. And that's what I actually love. I, I, I mean, we play Passion by Rod Stewart. And we mix it with like Stormbringer into a Joe uh, meets now, uh, uh, you know, five songs in one, and I love that kind of disco rock. Um, and maybe I make it sound cool because I love it. And that's the, the lesson here. If you love something, just go for it because it will be okay. If it's okay for me, it will be okay for others too. And yeah. Huh? It's a beautiful piece. Judas, uh, Judas Priest. <laughs> okay, Judas Priest. Um, I don't know the classical stuff. Um, uh, well, Mozart and Bach. Uh, I played Mozart. Uh, what is this? This uh, is it? Ballade for uh, huh? something. Lucas, write it. Uh, ah, staying alive. That's the that's the 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 the, the song by by the beaches. And it it is as disco and funky as Stormbringer. No. <laughs> Thank you. 
<laughs> uh, more inspiration or less? Guitars. Um, hey guys, any questions at this point? Um, you have to refresh. You have to refresh. <laughs> ah, no. Uh, what's going on here? Somebody has um, some rehearsal tricks to get so fast with picking um, and the left hand fingers. Right hand, left hand. Okay. Um, tons of ideas. Um, so the, the, the biggest thing about playing fast is to get synchronicity between the right hand and the left hand. So let me show you when I have... Okay. Um, the right hand movement here should be fast and controlled first. That's one thing. And it should not be a big movement. If, if you look Ingwi, more is more. <laughs> he actually is less is more because he has a small uh, movement. When, when you look and the movement is less movement. It's, it, it, it's fast, but it's not like aggressive wild. Very, it's it's very um, very clever the way he he picks fast, but I guess it's it's like only here from the wrist downwards, not the lower part of the of the arm. So once you have that kind of you can also think of these kind of Greek sounds. Think of this kind of tremolo. That's the right hand. So the other thing is like we all know legato and the cheating. Uh, let's talk about Satriani. Use some fat overdrive. D is one into a you know plexi Marshall and you are Joe. Um, and you can play all that legato stuff pretty easily. Um, now is about the synchronization. So the way I practice this is like uh, it's like an, a little expedition uh, around that note G. Let's have G major. What I'm doing is kind of my right hand is is up to speed and I try to make my left hand meet at the same point when I hit the string and I fret this, the, the fret. Um, of course it's not always totally in sync and I'm cheating here and there but the beginning and the end is definitely clear so this is my thing about the groove. I, I do so. Two, three, four. So I'm very physical working to the beat, so I know that's the beginning and that's the end. Um, that's my way how to get fast. And this is what I practiced. Um, oh, I see somebody. Uh, Grüße aus Calgary. I think Calgary is uh, not Italy, is um, the island. Um, I've been there. <sighs> What's the name? Fuck. 
Yeah. Canada. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Cool. Um, Peter Urban. What are you doing there? So, um, somebody is asking the question, how are the metal amps uh, on the amp X coming along? Yes, that's the last two night shifts. And the good news is we are getting there. And it's, it's hilarious. We have a 5150 and the 5150 is a rip off of a Soldano. You can see when you look at the schematics, it's, it's the same shit. And it adds some other uh, stages. It's, they all were stealing from each other and, and then took it to a little bit other thing. It's a great amp. We know what to do. Yeah. Next week I will do a Q and A and I will talk a little bit about amp X next week. So, but um, yeah, I'm in a good mood because we, we make progress. And the good thing is once we understand what the original amp is doing, we can recreate it. And then it's unbelievable. It's the same. I mean, we are not using traditional tubes. We do our analog circuitry and it sounds the same. A, B, switching back and forth. It's like unbelievable. It, it simply works. Um, somebody wants one of the vintage brand blue guitar. Uh, well, there is a brand called Vintage. Um, from the UK that makes these uh, affordable guitars and then there's the blue guitars which uh, uh, I, I have them all at the office uh, at the moment and there's one uh, parts caster which is a blue guitar neck here uh, in the back with a vintage body it's leftover caster I, I like that guitar as well um, yeah, Mario Stracuzzi, I was in Sardinia, Calgary. And <laughs> yeah, but I also was in Canada. Um, um, yeah, sorry. I, I was thinking of Sardinia and then noticed, fuck, it, it, this is uh, Canada. Uh, and I've been there as well. Um, now Peter has a good life. He he eats that's good thing work that's nothing wrong about working sleep it's good thing and play guitar cool um cool so guys i think um i made my point for tonight or for today um just for yourself try to reduce certain things for a moment it's not a problem it is a win you can take something from that and it will make you different. And as I believe, it will make you a slightly better player um, because that happened to myself. And, you know, if you have a tube screamer or any of those classic pedals that, that also works like an, you know, just turn down the tone in front of the vintage channel and I can do the, the Les Paul thing too. This is something that I've been using. So there's stuff, or if you have an EQ, uh, you can actually uh, match guitar sounds. One, one guitar that has something, you can get similar results from another guitar by changing just the, the EQ, because that's what in my what's in my magic red pedal here um, or something like this light speed is a nice pedal that um, can be like similar um, like the sound is very similar on by from bypass and then you can tweak it from that point um, to have a bit more of this or less of that so that's kind of a neutral uh, thing and here's another example that is actually not working properly. It's, it's a homemade um, overdrive that I used in my tic-tac-toe days to get a specific sound that I couldn't get for my amp because the producer used a, I think it was a valve state 
and my tube sounds, my real tube sounds were too, too good, too woody and not ugly enough. So that kind of overdrive pedal did the job to make my Strat sound like a 335 through a Marshall Valve State. Sometimes that's what's needed. And yeah, I, I did my, myself uh, a pedal for that job so I could play my Strat. These days you can buy pedals, anything. There's so much on the market. You will find something that does the same thing. You don't have to build stuff yourself anymore. Hundreds of thousands of pedals. And by the way, this goes back to the, to the whole story. If you spend more time in the internet, which is a good source uh, of information, but if you spend too much time there, it is distraction. It takes the energy away from the playing. And what I just did a few minutes ago where I just tried to get lost in music, this is where the music lives. And watching other people on YouTube is okay, but if you watch too much, you lose your own ability to connect with yourself. You are just connected with the outer world. Try to get connected with your inner world. That's why I was on a vacation. Okay, doga, guys, I think um, that's enough philosophy for today. I'm looking forward for next week and um, prepare questions about anything. Um, if you have stuff that is uh, bugging you, you can write to YouTube at Blue Guitar and maybe I can prepare something if I find uh, interesting topics that you would like um, to ask me. And maybe I can pick some of that stuff for next week. Um, and then we will talk more next week in the next episode. The week after that, there will be a huge thing for me because this is like 10 years of blue guitar existing. And there's so many stories, memories, pictures. I have to prepare for that. that it's, that's So tons of live streams, ideas coming up. But if you have questions or if you have some ideas for me to do on this channel for you guys, let me know, youtube at blueguitar.com. See you guys next week. Have a good one. Cheers. Bye-bye.